Um, yeah, this workshop I mean, the last year, uh, it was the first DSM workshop in my university, Jungwon University. Uh, this is the second series. Uh, I wanted to have offline workshop for this year, but uh, the COVID situation is not that good. So I decided to have another DSM workshop online. So uh, hopefully you will enjoy the workshop and have a uh, nice discussion during the workshop. And yeah, hopefully we will meet again in person in the near future. So the first speaker of the uh, BSA workshop uh, is Dan Hooper from University of Chicago. Uh, so thank you for your uh, giving uh, this nice presentation as the first speaker. Uh, the title of, of his talk, Dark Matter <laughs> Persons and the Galactic Center Gamma Ray Exams. So, so. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and for the opportunity to talk about um, some of my work and, and others' work um, at this very nice meeting. Um, so I'll just jump right into it. Um, so let me start with some very general words uh, motivating the whole indirect detection program as I currently see it. So um, in contrast to some other efforts to search for dark matter particles, there is a close relationship between the origin of dark matter particles in the form of WIMPs in the early universe and their prospects for detection with gamma ray and cosmic ray detectors. So in particular, if you have a, a particle that was in equilibrium in the early universe and it froze out um, in early times to produce the observed dark, dark matter relic abundance, the cross section for the annihilations of that particle at the time of freeze out has to be about two times 10 to minus 26 cubic centimeters per second. So there are, of course, lots of model dependent factors that can move this number up and down um, from this benchmark at low velocities as you would find in the galactic halo. But most models, not all, but most predict annihilation cross sections in the universe today, which are within an order of magnitude or so of this estimate. So when we put out into space gamma ray telescopes or on ground for that matter, or when we have cosmic ray detectors that are sensitive to dark matter annihilating with approximately this level of annihilation cross section, we are meaningfully testing the whole paradigm of thermal relic WIMPs, uh, which of course historically have been the main paradigm for dark matter over the last several decades. So, a variety of strategies using gamma rays, in particular measuring gamma rays from the galactic center, from dwarf galaxies, among the isotropic gamma ray background, and among others, um, as well as uh, search of dark matter using cosmic ray antiprotons and positrons. All of these are currently sensitive to dark matter at this sort of benchmark annihilation cross section level I was just talking about, at least up to masses on the order of 100, 100 GeV or so. So in the lower left frame here, um, I have the constraints for leptonically annihilating dark matter using the AMS positron measurements. Um, these uh, go up to a couple hundred GeV for annihilation C plus E minus. Um, in the middle, I have the Fermi collaborations constraints based on observations of dwarf galaxies. These go up to several tens of GeV for um, hadronically annihilating dark matter. And then in the right, I have a one example of the constraints you can derive from the antiproton spectrum in the cosmic rays as measured by AMS. Um, these, with the exception of this, this region where there's an excess at uh, you know, 50 or 100 GV or so, which I'll come back to later, um, with the exception of that, we can rule out the thermal relic cross-section up to masses up to about a TeV. So these things, th these experiments are really uh, teaching us about WIMPs or the nature of dark matter in a way that's, that's pretty important and decisive at this time. All right, so turning our attention to the specific signal I wanna talk about today, um, the Fermi telescope has clearly detected a <laughs> and highly statistically significant excess of gamma rays from the direction of the inner galaxy. Um, this signal I think is objectively difficult to explain with known astrophysical sources or mechanisms um, but its characteristics map on very nicely to the characteristics you'd expect from annihilating dark matter particles. There's a long history of work in this direction. Here are some of the early references, but there are many other papers that have contributed to the story. Um, but for sake of brevity, here are just a few that I think are particularly noteworthy. So let me say a few things about the characteristics and measured characteristics of the signal, um, starting with the angular distribution or morphology. 
So this GV excess exhibits approximately spherical symmetry with respect to the galactic center. Um, you can characterize this quantitatively as saying the axis ratios are within 20% or so of unity. It's not uh, prolate or oblate or something at more than a level of 0.8 or 1.2. Um, and the flux of the, the signal falls off with the distance of the galactic center uh, to uh, the 2.4 power or so, at least out to 10 or 15 degrees and maybe farther. If we interpret the signal as a products of dark matter annihilation, it would imply a dark matter density profile that goes like R to the minus 1.2, at least out to a one or two or two and a half kiloparsecs. Um, this is similar to, but only slightly steeper to the canonical NFW profile. In fact, if you take uh, the results of modern hydrodynamical simulations like Eagle and these other groups, you tend to find halo profiles that are in good agreement with um, that required to explain this excess. All right, so the spectrum of this excess um, peaks at an energy of a couple GV, and overall the spectral shape is in good agreement with dark matter particles that might be annihilating to hadronic channels with masses in, in the range of, say, 20 to 65 GV, depending on exactly what kind of quarks they're annihilating to. And here I show a table with the preferred masses as calculated by Calore and company um, in the series of papers from 2014. Um, importantly, the shape of the spectrum appears to be uniform across the inner galaxy. This disfavors, um, for example, cosmic outburst models where um, inverse Compton scattering of high energy electrons are responsible for the signal. In that case, you'd expect electron cooling to lead to diversity or variance of the spectral, spectral shape across the inner galaxy. That's not what's observed. Whatever's producing the signal is approximately uniform in its shape, its spectral shape everywhere, um, such as you would expect from dark matter annihilation. Um, it's important, or at least it's, it's, it's interesting to note that the overall intensity of the excess, um, if interpreted as the products of dark matter annihilation, favor an annihilation cross-section within a factor of a two or three of the canonical uh, thermal relic prediction of two times to the minus 26. It, it Maybe the cross-section favored is slightly lower, but between one and two times to the minus 26. Um, this is either a remarkable coincidence or it's indication that we're looking at uh, dark matter annihilation products. Okay, so um, over the course of the last uh, dozen years or so, there's been a lot of ink spilled about what could produce a signal. A lot of it was talking about dark matter annihilation, but a lot of it was also talking about millisecond pulsars. And I think that is where the debate has settled at this point. Um, no one's really arguing that this excess isn't there anymore. That's that, that, that issue has been put to rest. And um, really no one talks about cosmic ray outbursts anymore. They really don't fit the data very well. So the debate seems to be between one of annihilating dark matter and a large population of faint millisecond pulsars. So in case you're a uh, you know, particle physicist or maybe a dark matter particle cosmologist or something, um, and you don't know much about pulsars, let me say a few words about millisecond pulsars just to kind of uh, give you some background. So what pulsars are, are rapidly spinning neutron stars, which are gradually converting the rotational kinetic energy into uh, a high energy emission, maybe radio emission, maybe gamma ray emission, things like this. Um, typical pulsars, the consequence of, of star formation, um, exhibit periods on the order of a second or so, and they slow down and lose their kinetic energy on time scales of millions or even hundreds of millions of years. However, there's another category of pulsars, millisecond pulsars, which um, are which take a, a, a non-rotating non neutron star and spin it up through some sort of uh, uh, interaction with a companion, through accretion with a companion. And these can obtain periods as fast as one and a half milliseconds. And these pulsars have much lower magnetic fields than young pulsars, so they actually spin down much more slowly so despite their much larger kinetic energies, rotational kinetic energies actually are much longer lived. So these typically uh, remain bright or remain rapidly spinning for hundreds of millions or billions of years. Um, and from this perspective, it seems at least plausible that there could be large numbers of these that have accumulated in the galactic center over the course of the Milky Way's history. All right, so let me try to summarize some of the arguments that have been made in the literature in favor of uh, pulsars and against pulsars as the source of the emission observed from the galactic center uh, that I'm calling the galactic center gamma ray access. 
So the, the main most important argument in favor of pulsars, and one that I think is, is, is valid, is that the gamma ray spectrum that we measure from observed pulsars is at least qualitatively similar to the gamma ray spectrum of the observed excess. Uh, that could be a coincidence, but um, it is suggestive of a pulsar origin. I will, con I will happily concede that point. Secondly, and, and this might seem like uh, I'm trying to be flippant, but I'm not, um, I, the, the fact that pulsars are known to exist should weigh one's Bayesian uh, assessment of the situation in favor of pulsars. After all, we don't know that WIMPs exist. Um, there are lots of arguments that think they, that for, to lead us to think that they might, but we don't know that yet. So pulsars should be evaluated um, with some more um, confidence or some, some more preference, I think, over WIMPs. And then there are two other kinds of arguments that have been made in recent years. Um, namely, that there have been these claims in the literature of small scale power in the gamma ray emission from the inner galaxy, and the claims in the literature that the excess or the shape of the excess or morphology of the excess traces the shape of the galactic bulge and bar system. Um, I'm going to argue against both of these points in this talk, but those points have been made. There, there are at least arguments that people have made in favor of a pulsar interpretation of the signal. All right, so let me talk about these two points that I'm going to try to argue against. Um, so the small scale power argument goes back to 2015 when two different groups um, reported that the GEV scale photons from the direction of their galaxy are more clustered um, than you would expect based on the on, uh, assessment of smooth backgrounds. Um, and this suggested, according to them, that the GEV excess might be generated by a population of unresolved point sources. So in particular, the Lee et al. collaboration, this is Lee, Lasani, Safdie, and Slatcher, um, used a non-Bosonian template technique to assess this. And they found that within 10 degrees of the galactic center masking the plane, um, they found the photon distribution of the excess to be clumpy, uh, potentially indicative of an unresolved point source population. And around the same time, I think the two papers came out within a week of each other, the Bartles et al. group, so this is Bartles uh, and Christoph Vinegar and others, uh, reached a qualitatively similar conclusion, employing a different statistical technique using uh, spatial wavelets. So let me talk about what you do in a typical non-Poissonian template analysis and put this kind of uh, study into analysis and uh, into uh, perspective for you. So a typical Fermi uh, analysis, a, a template-based analysis, might include a sum of different spatial templates. And then at each energy bin, you add these templates together and you set the coefficients of those templates based on the data. So templates might include uh, various kinds of galactic diffuse emission, like pion production and inverse Compton scattering and Bremsstrahlung might include something accounting for the, the, the Fermi bubbles or an isotropic template, maybe templates associated with various kinds of known point sources, and then maybe some sort of template associated with dark matter annihilation. So Lee et al. took us this, this standard approach, but then they added to their analysis a number of non poissonian templates in an effort to model um, different kinds of unresolved point source populations that might exist. So they had um, non-Poissonian <clears throat> templates associated with uh, 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 isotropically distributed point sources, like maybe unresolved blazars or something. Um, they had a non-Poissonian template accounting for discorrelated point sources, so maybe uh, ordinary galactic sources clustered along the disk. And then they had something that could account for the galactic center gamma ray access, something that looks like a dark matter profile squared, but not smooth like dark matter would produce, but instead something clumpy like you'd expect from unresolved point sources. Here's a plot from their paper and it kind of summarizes what they find. Um, in particular, what they find at high luminosities is something that looks like point sources associated with the disk, just like the resolved sources Fermi's already reported. But then at lower luminosities, right around the Fermi detection threshold, where maybe an individual source might be bright enough to produce two, three, four, five, something like this photons, in this sort of range of fluxes or luminosities, they found a lot more power. So these are sources that are just below the detection threshold. These are sources that you wouldn't expect to find in the point source catalogs, but that could potentially produce the gamma ray excess if, they're, if they exist in large numbers. And this original uh, study found that they expected something like a thousand of these point sources with luminosities right around the detection threshold seem to exist, and they could potentially account for this excess. So my assessment at the time, and continues to be my assessment to this day, 
is that it's really hard to tell whether the, these clustered gamma rays are really the result of unresolved point sources, as these authors claimed, or rather instead they're from backgrounds that are less smooth that are being modeled, okay? So here's one interpretation of the data. So here's some directional axis, I, you know, some, your, some scan across the region of interest. And, and maybe you observe this the kind of clustered looking uh, clumpy uh, um, irregular uh, distribution of photons because the backgrounds are smooth like you think and the, the uh, galactic center excess is in fact clumpy. Or equally well, as far as the data is concerned, and maybe you observe that because the, the galactic center excess is smooth and coming from dark matter, but you haven't modeled the backgrounds very well. And because the backgrounds are so much brighter than the galactic center excess, it would be very easy to have small uh, imperfections with your background modeling that would lead to the false appearance of uh, clumpiness in your galactic center excess if your templates aren't adequate for the job. And I think that's an extremely plausible interpretation. So this was something I argued was plausible for a number of years, but in, in uh, 2019, I think it went beyond plausibility to, um, let's just say demonstrably the case, when uh, Rebecca Lean and Tracy Slasher wrote this very nice paper. Um, they've since changed the title uh, to placate some referees, but I'm gonna use the original title of Dark Matter Strikes Back at the Galactic Center. So here is this, the result from the original Leela Santi, Safdie and Slasher paper from 2015. And uh, what this is showing is, is the fraction of the flux that you attribute to either a uh, clumpy, uh, presumably point source emission associated with the galactic center and smooth, um, perhaps dark matter-like emission from the galactic center. And in the original analysis, they found that something like 8% of the emission from the region of interest was coming from clumpy point source-like emission. And none of the emission was coming from something that looked like dark matter. So Lean and Slasher get the same result when they repeat the analysis, but then to test the robustness of this result, they add to the Fermi data, they actually take the data and they add uh, an analytically calculated dark matter-like signal, so a smooth signal. If this process is working, if, the, if this technique is working correctly, you should see the dark matter part of the result go up accordingly, because after all, you know you're adding dark matter to the data set but that's not what happens. Instead, despite having just added a dark matter-like signal to the data, the FIT doesn't ascribe any of this extra signal to the dark matter template. Instead, the FIT identifies the injected dark matter-like signal as originating from point sources. This is obviously not true, and I think it demonstrably shows that this technique isn't reliably telling you that the emission that we're calling the glad center access is coming from point sources, or is that it's clumpy at all? So you can take this technique and, and, and take it even farther. We can add even a bigger signal to the data. So, and, and you just find that the, the fit just continuously wants to attribute this to a clumpy point source population. Even if you go up um, in intensity by an order of magnitude beyond the size of the galactic center access. So the bottom line, the thing you should walk away with from this exercise is that these non-Bosonian template fits are clearly misattributing the dark matter-like signal to point sources. This demonstrates that the templates being used aren't adequate to accurately describe the data and this strongly biases the results of the fits. The method doesn't provide evidence of point sources, at least at this time, it maybe could in principle with better templates, but for now we just can't use this technique to uh, favor point sources or disfavor dark matter as an interpretation of, the, of this uh, galactic center gamma ray access. So I mentioned there were two papers who found this conclusion. The other one used this wavelet technique. So this is uh, Bartles, Vinegar and Company. Um, and more recently, uh, the work by uh, Zong, McDermott, Cholas and Fox, um, again, showed this isn't finding re reliable results. In particular, the evidence that was reported originally in the Bartles et al. paper seems to just be attributed to unrelated point sources that have since been identified by Fermi. If you repeat this analysis using the updated 4FGL, 4FGL Fermi collaboration catalog of point sources, um, evidence of any kind of unresolved point source population goes away. 
and um, the preference for a smooth dark matter like galactic center gamma ray excess persists. So I, I think we can look at, look at the situation now um, as one in which um, a dark matter like interpretation of the signal is entirely consistent with the data. Um, and these techniques don't seem to be able to really resolve the question at hand in any kind of conclusive way. Also just mentioned that the wavelet results really are in consistent, uh, considerable tension with pulsar interpretations of the signal, in particular in, in terms of the luminosity uh, uh, distribution or luminosity function of, of known pulsars. Um, observed populations of millisecond pulsars, like those in the disk of the Milky Way and then the globular cluster population of the Milky Way, have luminosities, um, luminosity functions that peak in the range of 10 to the 34 to 10 to the 35 ergs per second. If we model this as a power law, um, these observations favor you know, spectral indices of 1.2 to 1.5 or something like this. But um, the wavelet uh, approach by Zong and company really show that this is completely incompatible with the data. You should have seen far, far more point sources if in, in the data, far more wavelet access if, in fact, uh, these sorts of millisecond pulsars were responsible for the access. So if you want to think that millisecond pulsars are responsible, you have to imagine that this is a different kind of pulsar population whose luminosity function is peaked at much lower luminosities than those we observe elsewhere in the Milky Way. All right, so that's all I have to say about the, the point source, unresolved point source uh, claims in the literature. Let's move on now to the claims that the morphology of the excess is better described by something that traces the galactic bulge or bar uh, system as opposed to something that's spherical and dark matter-like. Um, th these claims originated from three papers by Machias et al., Bartels et al., and then later Machias et al. again. And the authors argued in these papers that the Fermi excess is better fit or traces the distribution of, of stellar matter in this, the, the bulge and bar uh, bulge. But more recent work um, seems to reach the opposite conclusion. In particular, the DeMauro paper from last year, and more recently, the paper by Cholas, Song, McDermott, and company. These papers seem to strongly um, favor uh, a shape of an excess that traces uh, an NFW squared or, or contracted NFW squared like distribution. Here's an example of a result from the recent Cholas et al. paper. For all of their best fit template models, um, the fit is, is, is wildly better for something that looks like a contracted NFW profile than either a boxy nuclear bulge model or an X-shaped bulge um, model. Um, so I, I think the, the, what you should walk away with here is that the results of these sorts of analyses depend on your detailed choice of astrophysical templates. And um, there's nothing about the data at this point that seems to uh, significantly prefer a bulge-like template over a dark matter-like template. Okay, so back to this list of arguments that have been made in favor of a pulsar-like interpretation. I think these two um, you should more or less disregard at this time. Maybe one day they'll be informative, but at, at this point they, they don't provide any, any uh, reason to prefer the pulsar interpretation of, of the signal over that of a dark matter annihilation interpretation. But there are several arguments that have been made, which I do think hold water today, um, against pulsar interpretations of the signal. And uh, these basically boil down to the fact that we still haven't detected any millisecond pulsars from the inner galaxy, and we really should have by now if, if that's the origin of the signal. Um, and then we haven't seen nearly enough low mass X-ray binaries in this part of the sky to account for the signal, and also the relatively low luminosity of the TV scale emission in the inner galaxy. All of these seem to work against pulsar interpretations of this access. So let me say a few words about each of these points. Um, so first of all, to be clear, that we've never observed a millisecond pulsar anywhere near the inner galaxy, the Milky Way. Um, there was this paper um, from a couple of years ago that argued that these three particular millisecond pulsars are likely to be part of an inner galaxy population, um, but they're not. Um, the, through parallax and other distance measurement techniques, we have measured the distance to these three sources, and they're much more close to us than to the galactic center. These are not part of an inner galaxy population. Um, I'm not sure why the authors made that claim. Furthermore, known gamma ray point sources do not appreciably contribute to the galactic center gamma ray access. Um, if you mask all of the pulsar candidates, if you take every 
source that you, you detect in gamma rays that might possibly be a pulsar, but we haven't detected pulsed emission from yet, and you just do the analysis again in the remaining part of the sky, you don't see it that it changes uh, the uh, characteristics of the inferred excess. Um, the, the, the unresolved point sources don't seem to be an appreciable part of the signal. So um, not only uh, haven't we seen any actual bright millisecond pulsars in this part of the sky, but there's no evidence that the near threshold um, sources in this part of the sky are in any way a significant con contributor to the galactic center gamma ray access. So millisecond pulsars are formed when they are spun up by a binary companion. And the precursor to a millisecond pulsar is, a, is a, an object known as a low mass extra binary or an LMXB. So in light of this, we can use the number of, low, of bright low mass X-ray binaries that are observed in the inner galaxy as a way of estimating how many millisecond pulsars we think should be there. So when we do this by comparing the ratio of LMXBs to millisecond pulsars in the inner galaxy to those in the Milky Way's globular cluster system, we find that only four to 11% of the gamma ray access could be attributable to millisecond pulsars. So there, there should be a gamma ray signal from this population of sources, but it should be down by a factor of 10 or 20 from the brightness that, that's been reported. Um, I, I, so I, I think this is at least one other good reason to think that millisecond pulsars are unlikely to be responsible for most of this access. All right, and then the final point I'll make along these lines has to do with these objects known as TV halos. So observations by Hawk um, this ground-based air uh, water shrink-up telescope um, have shown that young and middle-aged pulsars appear to be universally surrounded by bright spatially extended multi-TV emitting regions, which we call TV halos. This emission um, is produced through inverse Compton scattering of very high energy electrons and positrons. And the brightness of these objects in implies that about 10% of the total spin down power, 10% of the total energy budget of these pulsars is being uh, transferred into the acceleration of very high energy electron positron pairs. So if millisecond pulsars also produce TV halos, and there's good reasons to think that if young pulsars do, then millisecond pulsars probably do as well, then we could use the TV scale emission observed in the inner galaxy to constrain the abundance of this class of objects. So until recently, it was just a, a matter of speculation whether millisecond pulsars would have TV halos. Uh, many theorists thought they would, but there was no, no, uh, no observations that favored or disfavored that, that conclusion. But in a recent study, um, Tim Linden and I used the publicly available Hawk data um, from the direction of 37 high spin down power millisecond pulsars. We found significant evidence that these sources do produce multi-TV emission at a, um, at a level of about 4.2 sigma. Um, and when we did a, a blank sky control group test, we found that less than 1% of the realizations we considered yielded as much significance. So um, a few sigma detection is what I would say we have of, of, of TV halos around uh, the millisecond pulsars in the sample. And furthermore, their efficiency seems to be comparable to those of young and middle-aged pulsars in the ballpark of uh, you know, 0.4 to 1.1 times the, the young pulsar efficiencies. So millisecond pulsars do really generate um, the GV access, then they should also approximately exceed or, or saturate the TV emission that we observe from this region from Hess. So this would be a very hard pill to swallow in my opinion, because we know that there are a lot of ways to make this emission associated with cosmic ray interactions with with gas and, and Bremsstrahlung, general inverse Compton scattering of the, of the cosmic ray electron population. Um, and you might try to say that you can relate, relieve these tensions with cranking up the B fields and having most of the energy go to synchrotron, um, but this would exceed the radio emission that's observed from the region very quickly. Um, so I, I think this is a problem for the millisecond pulsar interpretation of the signal. And to whatever extent you think it's a problem now, I'm optimistic that CTA would, will either be able to uh, clearly detect um, this TV halo emission and, uh, and make sense of the situation or, or just be able to really rule out millisecond pulsars as a significant contributor to the galactic center camera access. All right, so let's ask the following question next. 
Um, so if the galactic center excess is the result of annihilating dark matter, where else might we expect to see evidence of this, this process? So I think one of the most promising places to look, and, and coincidentally, perhaps it, it's, it's shown up, is in the uh, cosmic ray antiproton spectrum. So an excess of cosmic ray antiprotons was pointed out in 2016 by two different groups um, shown here. Uh, both papers identified a small but statistically significant excess in, in the AMS data. And what I think these papers established, they didn't establish the excesses from dark matter or something like this, but I think they clearly established that if you use out of the box gal prop background models based on uh, observed primary secondary ratios of, of the cosmic ray populations, then you couldn't explain what AMS was observing in terms of antiprotons. But if you included a 40 to 70 GV WIMP annihilating with a 10 to the minus 26 cubic centimeter per second annihilation cross-section to hadronic channels, then you could, you could explain um, this small excess um, at rigidities of 10 or 20 GV that you couldn't in a way um, that Galprop-like background models would, would uh, allow you to do. So the 2016 papers on, on, this, on this excess um, didn't get that much attention at the time. Um, at last I checked, they had 130 citations each or something. If this was really a, a detection of dark matter, you'd expect them to have received a lot more attention by now. Um, and, and the reason is the community was pretty skeptical of their claims. Um, and the skepticism was largely driven um, by concerns about the very systematic uncertainties that these kinds of uh, detection channels face. And I think these are some reasonable um, concerns. This skepticism is, is warranted to a certain extent. In particular, um, people worried about uh, how well we have modeled the cosmic ray injection and transport in the ISM. But I think the original papers by Cuoco and Koi et al. Like, address this pretty well. So I, I, I think this is an, this is a, an answer that has already been, um, our question's already been answered. So I'm not particularly concerned about that. Where I'm more worried about is in our ability to model and characterize the antiproton production cross-section. Um, this is a, a real problem and it has real uncertainties associated with it. And then another issue that people have worried about is the impact of the solar wind or what we call solar modulation on the local cosmic ray spectrum. So in my work with Ilias Cholis and Tim Linden, we tried to allow a lot of freedom in, in, in how the antiproton production cross-section was measure, uh, was characterized. And we very carefully met, uh, accounted for the effects of solar modulation using a, a sophisticated model that is now possible to employ based on the very detailed and, 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 and uh, time-dependent AMS data. And when we did this, we always found that this anti-proton production or this anti-proton uh, cosmic ray excess persisted. We could make it go down from four and a half sigma to 3.3 sigma or something, but we couldn't make it go away. Other groups have made it go down a little bit more by, by basically giving more freedom to the antiproton production cross-section. Um, in particular, Winkler et al. have, have done this, but um, there's always a small one or two sigma excess even in those works. And, and I, th I think it's, it's suggestive of, of, a, of being a real signal. And, and more importantly, looking forward, I think uh, measurements of the antiproton production cross-section in laboratory environments will um, go a long way to being able to give us confidence that this is or is not a, a, an actual signal of annihilating dark matter. <clears throat> when we marginalize over all the parameters in our fit, we find that the antiproton production cross-section uh, favors a uh, nylon dark matter particle with a mass in the range of 45 to 95 GeV in a cross-section of 0.7 to 5 times 10 to the minus 26 cubic centimeters per second. Again, but this is just for the benchmark case of annihilation to BB bar. And this overlaps nicely with the range of parameters that is favored by the galactic center access. In particular, if the dark matter is in the range of 50 to 70 GV with a thermal cross-section, you can explain both of these excesses uh, simultaneously. One experiment that I'm really excited about is GAPS, which um, is scheduled to have its, uh, its first flight later this year. Um, their searches for cosmic anti-deuterons and anti-helium nuclei um, should have a lot to bear on this question at hand um, and could heat this, uh, this story up quite a bit, make things very exciting. We'll see. Looking forward, one other kind of measurement I'm really excited about 
are uh, these deep radio surveys, uh, searches for, for millisecond pulsars in the inner galaxies, in the inner galaxy. So if, if millisecond pulsars do generate the galactic center gamma ray access, then these surveys should be able to detect a large number of these individual sources, their pulsed emission. So for example, Green Bank, um, after about 100 hours of observation, should be able to detect a couple of these, at least statistically speaking, you'd expect. And um, with Meerkat, after a similar exposure, you should be able to detect dozens of, of, of uh, millisecond pulsars from this part of the sky if, if the access is, is, is generated by them. Um, hundreds of these sources could be detected by SKA. So my, my view is that if these telescopes perform remotely as, as, as advertised and they don't see a large number of millisecond pulsars, we could very conclusively rule out millisecond pulsars as the origin of the glass center access, uh, thereby by default favoring a dark matter interpretation. And if millisecond pulsars are responsible, this would be a way to very clearly demonstrate that and convince people like me that um, the dark matter interpretation isn't, isn't uh, supported by the data. So I, I, I think this either way, this will very uh, be very powerful in clarifying the situation. Okay, so um, I'm just gonna spend maybe five minutes uh, summarizing some of these conclusions and then we'll have time to take some questions if anybody has any. Um, so first of all, I just, I wanna emphasize this point that um, this isn't a fishing expedition we're doing here. Um, indirect searches in the form of modern gamma ray telescopes and cosmic ray detectors are currently testing precisely the range of annihilation cross sections that we expect a thermal relic to have if it makes up the dark matter of our universe, at least up to masses in the order of 100 or a few hundred GeV. Um, this isn't just some random corner parameter space where we happen to find an excess. This is exactly where our theoretical expectations lead us to expect a signal to most likely appear. So this is a big part of what goes into my assessment of this picture. It makes me, makes me very excited about the signal in a way that I, would, I wouldn't be quite as excited if it had, it had appeared just in some corner, um, a parameter space without such compelling theoretical motivation. So I would argue furthermore that along with the very impressive um, progress that's made in the direct detection uh, program, um, these telescopes and detectors have made incredible progress and are actively testing what, what I'd call the WIMP paradigm. When I say the WIMP paradigm, what I mean is that there's some sort of particle that interacts enough to have been produced in, at an equilibrium level abundance in the early universe. The expansion of the universe eventually caused these particles to freeze out of equilibrium and left behind uh, to make up the dark matter of our universe. If that's the case, then these experiments are testing that picture, um, at least in, in broad strokes. And uh, we, we're, we're, we're getting to a point where um, if, if dark matter consists of WIMPs, we should expect to have seen it. And if, uh, if, if, if you think that WIMPs are a likely can for dark matter, we shouldn't be that surprised that they show up in the ways I'm talked about in, this, this, uh, in, in these accesses we've talked about today. So the Gladys Center's GB access or the Gladys Center gamma ray access um, remains very compelling in my opinion. So it, it's highly statistically significant. Um, it's robust to uh, a wide variety of analysis techniques. It's spatially extended out to 10 or 20 degrees from the galactic center. It's approximately spherical in its morphology, and it's not easily explained with any known or proposed astrophysics. Earlier efforts to uh, detect uh, evidence of unresolved point sources using non-Poissonian template techniques or wavelet techniques have not held up to latter scrutiny. Uh, we now have no evidence at hand that this excess is mostly or significantly produced by near threshold point sources. And it's completely consistent with coming from a smooth dark matter like signal. Um, on similar grounds, the claims that the Glaxer excess is uh, traces in morphology, the shape of the bulge or bar system, um, these have not held up to more recent scrutiny. Um, so I think at this point, it, it's entirely consistent um, the data is entirely consistent with originating from a dark matter uh, annihilation uh, origin at this point. Um, furthermore, arguments based on a number of uh, gamma ray bright millisecond pulsars, bright low mass X-ray binaries, and diffuse TV scale emission, all of these things disfavor millisecond pulsars as the main source of this emission. Um, you can't rule out the possibility that maybe a different kind of population of millisecond pulsars are responsible, maybe a fainter uh, population, a very numerous, consisting of tens of thousands of such sources, 
This is the sort of thing you have to envision, but we've never seen a population like that anywhere else in the sky. Um, so it does require something of, uh, you know, a speculation to explain in, the, in those terms. Um, I'm excited about the future here because uh, not only gamma ray observations of dwarf galaxies, but future observations of cosmic ray antimatter with GAPS or AMS and future deep radio surveys all have the opportunity to shed a lot of light on this question. Um, it should be very clear um, with the, the new data that, that I'm envisioning to, to say whether this is coming from annihilating dark matter or some sort of exotic pulsar population or, or, or none of the above. These are answerable questions in the not so distant future. So uh, keep on the edge of your seats if you're like me and uh, stay, stay tuned to these, these experiments as they collect their data. Thank you. Thank you very much for your nice overview and yeah, interesting talk. I'm sure that there will be uh, some questions. Please uh, raise your hand or speak directly. Yeah, Hong Chan, do you want? Yes, I have a question. Yeah. Thank you for the nice talk. So can oh, you pleasure. briefly mention, uh, briefly mention um, dark matter uh, decay versus dark matter annihilation to explain the excess? Sure. So um, the main difference between the two is whereas you need a dark matter density profile that goes like R to the minus 1.2 to explain the signal with annihilating dark matter, if you instead had decaying dark matter, you would need something twice as steep, something goes like R to the minus 2.4. Um, I don't think this is compatible with our understanding of galaxy formation and things like this. Um, so there could be a decaying dark matter component, but it seems very unlikely to generate the signal at hand. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. So do, we have some time, like uh, four minutes for discussion and questions. So you can feel free to ask any questions. Okay. Uh, then in the meantime, let me ask a question. Uh, so you proposed a document, WIM documenter to explain both a galaxy center excess and anti-proton excess at the same time. So could you comment on the prospective for direct detection? Uh, I mean, Good. this article. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about the direct detection program at large, um, the, the Xenon and LZ collaborations in particular. Um, you know, I, I don't, I don't know. They're, they're very tight lips. I don't know exactly the state of their experiments, but um, I'm, I'm, their, their first and, and final results will be very exciting in the months or years ahead. Um, and, but unfortunately, or well, from a certain point of view, it's unfortunate that you can't map on an expectation for dark matter annihilation cross section to an expectation for its elastic Saturn cross section with nuclei, at least not in a model independent way. Um, you can have two different WIMPs, both of which have the same annihilation cross-section and have elastic Saturn cross-section with nuclei that vary by many orders of magnitude. So um, in, unless you specify some of the aspects of the, the theoretical model you're considering, you just can't make a mapping from one to the other. That being said, um, if, if, uh, if, if, if I'm told that there's good reason from indirect detection perspectives that a order 50 GB WIMP exists, then um, the odds that it will show up in the next factor of you know, 5, 10, 20, 50, whatever in, 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 in direct detection space and that cross-section are much higher. So um, I, I don't think these techniques are, are competing with each other as much as uh, thriving off of each other's successes. Um, and furthermore, so I, I said that that's a reason to be pessimistic about or, or disappointed by, by the, the comparison of the two. But I would also argue that if you really want to learn the nature of the WIMP and, and, and understand what kind of particle physics theory underpins it, you ideally want to measure its not only its mass and annihilation cross section and its annihilation products, but you also want to measure other characteristics such as its spin independent or spin dependent elastic Saturn cross sections to nuclei. So um, with that much information, I think you could really begin to narrow down pretty dramatically or maybe even identify a unique solution to the dark matter model building parameter space, um, teaching us what dark matter is like, which then we can use in turn to try to constrain 
um, the uh, the uh, characteristics of the very early universe, you know, a millionth or less of, than a second after the Big Bang, which would be a very exciting uh, future program for our field to embark upon. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for your answers. Uh, are there more questions? I think I can get, uh, I pick uh, one or two questions. Okay, so let me ask one more question. Uh, I think the Song Chan asked an interesting question about decaying versus annihilation. But even in the annihilation uh, case, uh, maybe you could make use of velocity separation for the direct detection in order to be compatible, or you could make, make kind of a secure, uh, secure time, uh, secluded, kind of secluded dark mirror such that the dark matter annihilate into intermediate particles and uh, some intermediate particle could decay uh, into the standard model particles, like a cascade channels. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, in that perspective, it might be a good idea to test between direct annihilation uh, and uh, cascade annihilation uh, from the galactic center excess or antiproton. So can you comment on that? Good. So let's separate two things. There's the morphological distinctions and there's the uh, spectral distinctions. So in terms of morphology or angular distribution of the signal, um, the glass center access is just so concentrated um, around the, at the, at, it's so bright at the, at the center and falls off so quickly in any given direction that even if you have some velocity dependence or other sorts of features, it, it's pretty hard to make um, uh, some sort of decaying picture work. But you can impact the uh, morphology of an annihilation signal subtly by invoking things like P-wave velocity suppression and things like this, absolutely. Um, and then when it comes to uh, annihilations that proceed to some sort of intermediate particle, which then later decays to produce the particles you observe, um, I mean, these are among my favorite classes of models. I like to call them hidden sector models. Um, but it's pretty hard to construct one where the particles travel long enough before decaying that it changes the morphology of the signal in question. Um, you know, even if they traveled parsecs before they, dis they, they decayed, it would leave the gamma ray signal, uh, the shape of the gamma ray signal, I should say the morphology, sorry, of the gamma ray signal largely intact. Um, that being said, the spectral shape that I've talked about, which can be fit by a 50 GV dark matter particle annihilating BB bar, could also be very easily fit by some sort of slightly heavier particle that annihilates to intermediate states, which then decay to things like quarks, for example. That's a perfectly consistent picture and uh, one that I'm actually pretty enthusiastic about. Okay. Okay, thank you. So, can one uh, yes. call, do you have a question? Okay. Uh, hello, uh, thank Hi. you very much for a nice talk. And uh, could you give your opinion on the uh, 511 KV gamma ray access, which was not discussed in your talk, please? Yeah, so I, I've done a lot of work on the 511 KV access over the years, so um, I'm, I'm still interested in it. I don't think we have conclusively uh, figured out where these uh, the positrons that are responsible come from. Um, but I will say that um, whatever makes those positrons, they have to make them very cold. Um, these, these positrons are, 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 are really cold when they annihilate. And that means that if, for example, you wanted to have annihilating or decaying dark matter make them, they have to, uh, uh, the masses of those annihilating or decaying dark matter particles have to be, you know, order of a few MeV or less. Um, so there's a bit of a tuning issue there. Um, I think when you compare that, combine, for the annihilating case anyway, when you combine that with constraints from BBN, probably you can't make it work. Uh, one idea that I've considered lately, and I wrote a paper with uh, my students, Les Keith and others about this earlier this year, is that maybe there's a population of uh, primordial black holes with masses in the range of roughly two times 16 grams. These could, if they were really centrally concentrated mm -hmm. with a very, very steep density profile, maybe these could, um, through Hawking evaporation, produce the positrons that are responsible for the signal. Um, these would make up a small fraction of the dark matter, so this wouldn't solve the dark matter problem, 
Um, but they would uh, certainly give us uh, you know, pretty interesting insights into the early universe. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I thank you for your nice talk and uh, discussion. We thank Thanks for them again. Okay, thank you. So uh, let's move on to the next speaker, uh, Byung-Won Ko from Kias. Uh, can you share your screen? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So let me introduce first. So the title of uh, next talk mu is muon G minus two and thermal dark matter with the U one L mu minus L tau gauge symmetry uh, revisited. <coughs> Please go ahead. Uh, okay. Uh, let me first thank you, uh, Hyunmin and uh, the organizers for the invitation. Mm. So today I I'm going to talk about mu G minus two and the thermal dark matter with uh, L mu minus L tau U one gauge symmetry. Uh, so this is the content of my talk. I briefly introduce uh, U1 and minus L tau gauge symmetry, including my uh, previous works and mu G minus two constraint and uh, L mu minus L tau charge dark matter. Uh, well, uh, I first summarize the, uh, the previous works by other groups where they consider G prime uh, mediate only. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about G prime plus uh, U1 breaking uh, uh, six G prime plus five. But the, this uh, U1 breaking the role of U1 breaking uh, six is not well uh, appreciated in the community. So I'm going to talk about uh, describe the uh, roles of the this. Uh, 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 U1 breaking scalar field phi in other uh, examples of dark matter phenomenology. And then I will discuss dark matter phenomenology with uh, G prime plus phi, uh, generic case, G2 and G3 cases, and conclude. So LMU uh, minus L tau gauge symmetry was first uh, proposed by uh, Xiao Gang Ho, Josh Liu, and Volkas in 1991. And this is interesting extension of the standard model because this is one of the anomaly free gauge group without extensions of standard model fermion contents. And uh, that and this U1 also uh, can couple to the standard model fermion directly, unlike the uh, U1 dark gauge symmetry, which can couple only through the kinetic mixing. And then this uh, this uh, LMU minus L tau gauge symmetry received some attention uh, because it can explain mu G minus two and the Pamela positron nexus. These are all old stories. And more recently, also some people, including myself, considered uh, B anomalies as well. But in this case, we need uh, extra fermions to, ge uh, to generate B to SLR. And I will not cover this uh, B anomaly topic in this talk, and I will just uh, talk about the mu G minus two and uh, thermal wind dark matter. So this is uh, <coughs> mu G minus two, the old BNL data around 2020, uh, around 2000, and then uh, Fermilab data last year, they are consistent with each other. And right after uh, Brookhaven National Lab data, uh, uh, Sungwon and Desh Pande, Xiaogang, and myself wrote a paper about mu G minus in U1 uh, LMU minus L tau model. And then uh, this is a summary of this paper. But the, in the right after the Pamela Positron Access announcement, uh, Sungwon and I wrote uh, the uh, LMU minus L tau charge dark, direct dark matter uh, model described here. This side is the direct dark matter mode, direct dark matter, which is charged on the UN L mu minus delta. And then we studied the mu G minus two and left field dark matter for positron, uh, Pamela positron excess and applied the signatures. So this is uh, the mu G minus two uh, uh, contribution from the uh, L mu minus delta gauge boson. And this is the collider signature for G prime going to. Uh, dimion, di tau, and the neutrino pair for muon neutrino and tau neutrino. And if it kinematically allowed, it can also decay into the dark matter pair. And if dark matter 
that is very light, then you have a very simple relation and uh, we can have a very predictive uh, collider signature for G prime. And this is a very old plot in 2008, and this blue band can explain the mu and g minus two, uh, and uh, uh, this uh, black solid curve corresponds to summary uh, density, correct summary density for different mass of dark metal. And we calculated the uh, uh, smoothness enhancement factor for different values of uh, dark, dark metal mass, and then. Uh, we studied the uh, parameter positron ratio to electron positron and also uh, the flux of the positron excess, etc. But this is all studied in 2008, which was published in 2009. And uh, five years later, Altman Spockfeder pointed out that the, there is a very strong constraint from the neutrino trident uh, event. And so basically, uh, this uh, in, in, interesting region for G prime mass around the uh, order of uh, electric scale is uh, largely uh, excluded. For the mu and G minus four, there is still a uh, uh, light uh, G prime region, uh, which is not uh, excluded by other experiment. Uh, of course, the one can evade this uh, neutrino trident constraint if one introduces new fermions and generate the muon G minus at a, a room level involving this uh, ex, uh, involving this new fermions. Uh, but the uh, and the, it will be in general can be related with uh, B anomalies. But the, as I mentioned in the beginning, I will not talk about this option. So I'll just uh, consider in this parameter region where G prime is very light and it can generate a mu and G minus at one room level. So let me now uh, move to the dark metal part. So let's first discuss briefly on the G prime only scenario. Uh, you know that the uh, for the this G prime uh, for the for this region G prime is order of ten to the minus four, so G prime is very small. So uh, dark matter pair annihilation into the uh, G prime pair, for example, is uh, highly suppressed. So you cannot have a correct relative density in general. So the uh, basically the dark matter pair annihilation through the G prime. Uh, and going to the standard model uh, particle, that will be the dominant annihilation channels. And a number of people uh, shown here uh, most recently, uh, they find that the MG prime around two times uh, of dark matter mass with S channel G prime resonance can give the correct relative density. And these two papers are uh, after mu and G minus two, uh, the announcement from the Fermi lab. However, uh, the, I, I'm going to talk, uh, point out that the dark matter with a massive dark photon cannot be uh, complete without dark Higgs. And this will be the main message of my talk today. And let me call G prime, for, I mean, you and me minus delta gauge boson as the dark photon since it couples the dark matter. So let me digress on the uh, role of the uh, dark Higgs. So this is, uh, uh, let me start with the Higgs portal dark metal models. Uh, this is the three uh, Higgs portal dark metal models for scalar dark metal, fermion dark metal, and vector dark metal. And these models have been uh, studied more than 10 years uh, by many groups. And basically I will consider, for example, vector dark metal uh, uh, model here. And then nice thing about this uh, uh, model is that the, uh, you can do phenomenology with uh, uh, two parameters, dark matter mass and the Higgs portal coupling. This is Higgs portal coupling for vector dark matter. And it looks like uh, uh, renormalizable, but it's not really the case because you, you give the uh, vector dark matter mass by hand. And this and there is an issue of the gauge invariance, which is not uh, transparent manifest in this uh, effective uh, model for vector dark matter. But if you naively uh, take this model as a model for vector dark matter with the Higgs portal interaction, then the, uh, uh, the allowed region for vector dark matter parameter is uh, uh, just this region and the most regions are all excluded. This is very old data. So basically uh, all these parameters are uh, ruled out. 
However, uh, this is not cannot be the uh, whole story because we need to include dark Higgs over single scalar to get normalizable unitary models for Higgs portals, uh, singular fermion or vector dark matter. Of course, UV completions are not unique, but still it's very important to uh, uh, see the effect of the uh, UV completion to the dark matter phenomenology. So this is the, uh, let me give you a UV completion of a singular fermion dark matter and the vector dark matter here. And here, the, uh, this is the sing size of singular fermion dark matter and we introduce the singular scalar S, which has a renormalized of Yukawa coupling to the singular fermion dark matter. And S will, uh, singular scalar S will couple to the Higgs boson, Higgs field through these two terms. So the dark matter eventually will communicate to the standard model particles through the uh, mixing between the singular scalar S and the uh, standard model Higgs boson. For the vector dark matter case, we can replace the uh, massive vector bo boson part by abelian Higgs model in the dark sector here. And this is a very familiar U1 abelian Higgs dark matter model, but uh, we have one more term, which is Higgs portal interaction between the standard model Higgs boson and uh, dark Higgs boson. And then if you uh, consider this UV completion, uh, there are two more parameters compared to the EFT. One, one parameter is uh, uh, dark Higgs mass scale, M5, and then the mixing angle between the dark Higgs and the standard model Higgs sine alpha. And the both of them can affect dark matter physics in a significant way. So for example, in the direct detection for the uh, fermion or vector dark matter case, uh, the, in the e effective approach, you will have only standard model Higgs exchange, but in the UV completion, you will have uh, both H1 and H2 uh, contribution, which is always destructive. So the strong constraint on the uh, direct station constraint uh, does not uh, constrain this uh, uh, coupling lambda, you uh, call coupling lambda directly because it's, there is a separation from the mixing angle and also there is a destructive interference between two uh, Higgs exchange here. And also uh, this uh, extra scalar boson can improve the vacuum stability up to the Planck scale. And also it can uh, modify Higgs inflation and uh, there, is a, there will be no tight correlation with the uh, top mass, uh, unlike in the case of the uh, Higgs inflation with the standard model Higgs boson only. And in this case, uh, for the vector dark matter case, uh, uh, again, you will have uh, after U1 dark gauge symmetry breaking, you will have a, a singular scalar phi, which is similar to the uh, singular scalar S in the previous case. And uh, depending on the uh, dark matter mass scale, uh, if M2 is greater than M1, and this region is allowed, and if M1 is, uh, uh, if dark X is lighter than M2, then the mass, dark matter mass below uh, 100 GeV is also allowed, okay? So, uh, and also the interaction Lagrangian for uh, scalar dark matter, singular formal dark matter, vector dark matter is uh, given here. And uh, uh, H1 is, uh, for example, 125 GeV, uh, standard model discovered that the, uh, uh, LHC, and it comes with the dark Higgs H2. So if you ignore H2 by hand, then uh, it will break uh, gauge invariance and the unitarity. You have to keep both of them, especially when you consider the uh, high energy scattering. So what is the collide implication of this uh, dark Higgs? In 2014, uh, the both CMS and Atlas uh, uh, measured the invisible Higgs branch ratio, upper bound and the invisible Higgs branch ratio, and they translated it into the uh, upper bound on the uh, Higgs portal coupling in the uh, Higgs portal dark matter EFT case. So it's color fermion vector. And then using this bound on the Higgs portal interaction uh, coupling, they could derive the bound on the dark matter nuclear cross section scattering. Yeah. And this is for vector and the fermion scalar dark matter case. But uh, if you study the same, same quantity in the UV completed model I described, 
the, there is a correction between the, uh, there is a uh, correction in the uh, relation between the uh, spin independent cross section in the full theory and the EFT theory by uh, this factor cosine alpha to the fourth times one minus mh scale over dark x scale to the scale. So if m2 is infinite, then uh, and if alpha going to zero, then EFT result will be the same as the uh, standard, uh, the UV complete case. Mm -hmm. But the <clears throat> But the M, if M2 is, uh, we don't know whether M2 is uh, uh, light or heavy. So if M2 is uh, light, for example, then the, the bound on the uh, direct detection can be much weaker than the bound quoted by Atlas and the CMS uh, based on the EFT approach. And this is for the fermion dark matter case, and this is for the vector dark matter case. So if in particular, if the uh, dark is uh, light, then the, uh, the EFT approach can be uh, very uh, misleading. And uh, uh, you know that the, uh, another important observable was the invisible Higgs decay into a pair of vector dark matter case. In the EFT case, the invisible Higgs uh, decay is given by this formula. And if you take MV going to the uh, zero, very light vector dark matter case, then this will diverge. So this quantity diverges when MV going to zero. But the, in the full UV completed theory, MV scale is related with the GX scale. So basically when we consider uh, MV going to zero limit, there are two possibility. One is GX going to zero with the finite free phi. And in this case, uh, this uh, prefactor is behaves something like that, and MV scale is given by this, so it's finite. One of MV five scale which is finite, and it's actually the same as the uh, HDK into the pair of Goldstone boson uh, in the GX going to general limit. So consistent with the Goldstone equivalent theorem. And another limit is a finite GX, but if we find going to zero, in this case, again, we find that the uh, Higgs invisible decay is finite and also compatible with the uh, Goldstone boson theorem, Goldstone equivalent theorem. So in any case, you will come in the uh, Higgs to uh, VV is finite when MV going to zero in the UV completions, but it's not the case in the EFT. And this shows clearly that the importance of the importance of the uh, dark matter phenomenology in the UV completed theory. So I will skip some of them. And if, for example, what, what, another use of the, this dark case is uh, for Fermi light gamma ray access, which was uh, well reviewed, uh, nicely reviewed by previous speaker. I will skip this part. But the uh, basically, uh, this based on uh, this paper. Uh, people find that they, this is all old story, not updated at all, but anyway, the main uh, message will be the same. So if we assume dark matter parallelization to BB bar with this uh, summer cross section, then we can fit the uh, gamma, ray, gamma ray spectrum uh, pretty well. And, but the, in order to make this uh, particle physics model for dark matter pair mainly uh, annihilated into BB bar, it will be highly on flavor dependent. And the simplest way to do, to make it happen will be using the Higgs-like particle mm -hmm. because the Higgs will always decay into the uh, heaviest particle that decay into. So uh, in this model, uh, in this paper with Yong Tang and Wani Park in 2014, we studied the uh, uh, vector dark matter pair on relation to BB bar. Uh, in the UV completed uh, Higgs photo vector dark matter model. And in this case, there are two types of diagram. One is a vector, uh, vector dark matter pair annihilation into BB bar. But also, there is another possibility, which is vector dark matter pair annihilation into the dark pair of dark Higgs. And dark Higgs will eventually decay into BB bar. And if this mass difference between V and H1 is small, the H1 will uh, uh, be produced almost at rest and the, the BB bar spectrum and the gamma ray spectrum from the H1 DK will be similar to the, uh, uh, this scenario here. So this is a new scenario and the, this, this scenario cannot be uh, realized in the EFT approach. It can be realized only UV completion with dark Higgs. 
And then we find that we can have a similar uh, camera access with uh, uh, vector dark matter pair annihilation into the pair of dark Higgs. And this is uh, uh, the naive chi scale analysis for uh, HX going to H2, H2. And so we find that the uh, with the M MX and the dark metal, darkest mass around the, this number will give a good fit. This is the. Uh... So there is another other slide for, uh, because I don't have enough time. So let me uh, skip this part. Another important uh, channel where dark Higgs can uh, can be important was uh, uh, the general lantern access two years ago. In the general lantern access, people studied, uh, uh, for example, exosomic scattering of the uh, uh, dark matter to xenon uh, atom, and then, uh, for example. In this paper, people studied uh, this diagram with uh, a prime. But the mass splitting between this uh, chi two and the chi one was generated by uh, this dimension two operator, which breaks u one dark gauge symmetry explicitly. So I don't think this is really uh, yeah, about five minutes. Yes, I don't think this is really the uh, consistent way to generate the mass gap here. And the better way to generate the mass gap is uh, using the uh, cross Wilson mechanism, uh, where u one dark gauge symmetry is broken to g two. Uh, by this uh, charge assignment, the dark Higgs phi and dark matter, scalar dark matter X and the Dirac dark matter chi with this uh, UN charge assignment. And for example, this is a gauge invariant and after phi develops an angular web, this will have X going to minus X G2 symmetry, which is a uh, UN original subgroup of original U1. And you will have a mass splitting between real part of X and immediate part of X. And uh, so basically uh, with the dark Higgs, you will have this channel XX dagger going to G prime and the G prime phi. And this is P wave. And so you can even a strong constraint from uh, CMB and BBN for light dark metal case. And this is uh, uh, the parameter space in the kinetic mixing and the G prime mass uh, for different mass scale of dark Higgs field, dark Higgs boson. And then for this uh, parameter space, we can explain both summary density and uh, uh, general lantern access. And for the fermion case, uh, we have we can have uh, this term which break u1 to g2. And then uh, this diagram is something new, which cannot be seen without dark Higgs. And this is the parameter region where we can explain both uh, um, correct layer density and uh, uh, general lantern access. So uh, with the, the main point is that with the dark Higgs boson, we can have a very light dark uh, thermal, thermal rim dark metal type model in P wave annihilation. So we don't have, a, we can evade the strong constraint from CMB. So now the finally, uh, let me show the what happened to LMU and minus tau, tau case. So here the plus uh, here preliminary we are uh, checking it again, but basically we are consider doing the basically the same thing. We are sure we introduce a, a dark X phi with a Q phi charge and then dark complex scalar X and uh, direct dark metal chi with uh, some dark charge here, and they are all uh, can be arbitrary in principle. But for if there is a relation between Q phi and Q X in this way. Q Two, twice or three times of dark matter, then you have to uh, be careful because uh, there will be additional term in the uh, scalar potential or Yukawa potential that can break U1 to G2 or G3. So for the generic case of a complex scalar dark matter, we will have a, a standard model Higgs and the scalar version S, uh, which is a new diagram here. This uh, uh, exchange of, uh, diagram with the uh, virtual S will be new which uh, can be seen only if you include dark Higgs. And these are also all new in the uh, models with dark Higgs. And with this uh, uh, diagrams including dark Higgs boson, we find that the 
Uh, this is uh, omega H scale versus lambda phi x, which is a quartic coupling between the complex scalar dark matter and the dark Higgs. And this is a uh, dark matter mass equal to one GB. And this is uh, uh, 10 GB, 100 GB, uh, one TB. And for we chose dark uh, matter charge equal to 0.9 and uh, uh, sign up equal to 10 to the minus four. For the G prime mass, we choose two values. One is 100 MeV, and another one is Mg prime is uh, around 11 MeV, which can explain, uh, which can help to relax the Hubble tensions using the delta N effective from the G prime going to the neutrino pair decay. And anyway, so uh, these are the plus for omega H scale lambda phi chi. And the solid curve is, uh, satisfy the direct detection constraint and the dashed curve is excluded by direct detection. And this reason we show the dark metal mass M1 and, uh, sorry, dark X mass M1 and uh, uh, quartic coupling lambda phi X, uh, which can produce a uh, correct thermal density. And this solid region again can uh, satisfy the direct detection constraint. So there is a plenty parameter space where uh, dark matter mass can be uh, very different from the uh, uh, Mg prime, okay? You can have even one TV dark matter uh, using this, uh, uh, dark, using the channels involving dark exposure. Uh, so either for 100 MeV or 11.5 G MeV. If the uh, uh, Q5 is equal to two times uh, uh, dark matter mass, then the, uh, you will have this, dio this type of diagram. And again, uh, I show the uh, lambda phi x versus omega h scale with the different, for the different values of the dark metal mass. And uh, uh, mg prime is uh, either 100 MeV or 11 MeV. And uh, we can see easily that the uh, different, I mean, heavier dark metal mass can be a thermal rim without uh, cons without uh, uh, any diff difficulty. So uh, we can, again, evade this Mg prime around two times M dark matter. Uh, uh, that this can be uh, completely relaxed by including dark Higgs. And G3 case, uh, the same. G3, U1 to G3 is possible only for uh, scalar dark matter, complex scalar dark matter case. And in this case, you can have uh, also semi uh, annihilation diagram shown here. And then uh, uh, here we show the uh, lambda 3 coupling versus uh, omega H scale. Any, and uh, in this region, you can have uh, correct relative density for uh, different values of the uh, dark matter mass. And for the Dirac fermion case, uh, uh, we, we, we need the coupling between the Dirac fermion dark matter and the uh, dark scalar. So uh, we have to uh, choose a proper uh, dark charge for the uh, Dirac fermion dark matter. And then if this U1 is broken to G2, then we can have this type of diagram. And then after using this diagram, we can show that the omega H scale versus uh, delta. Delta is the now, the, for the G2 dark matter, it's a kind of inelastic dark matter. Uh, and the delta is generated by uh, gauge symmetry breaking. And delta is a kind of parameter. So uh, for different values of the dark matter mass, uh, there is uh, some uh, mass splitting, which can give the correct thermal density. And uh, <clears throat> I think there is some uh, typo in the uh, legend. But anyway, so, and this is a uh, uh, parameter space of delta mass spreading and the uh, dark Higgs for different mass of uh, values of the dark, uh, dark metal mass. And again, we can have uh, uh, a very heavy dark metal with uh, a correct relic density and the satisfying direct detection constraint. So conclusion of my talk is that dark matter physics with massive dark photon is not complete without including dark gauge symmetry breaking Higgs field phi, which have been largely ignored by dark matter community. And uh, I discussed a number of examples showing the importance of phi. And once phi is included, then we can accommodate the muon G minus 10 thermal dark matter without the S-channel resonance condition. 
And basically, uh, dark matter mass will be essentially free, whereas mg prime is in this range to solve the uh, mu g minus two uh, 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 data. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for your interesting talk. Uh, are there questions? Some comments? So, okay, may I ask one question about mu g minus two in and mu and minus tau models? In the beginning of your talk, you said because of neutrino trident production, uh, mu g minus two region, uh, I mean, most of parameter space for g prime mass has been ruled out because of the uh, neutrino trident production. Yes. So, so in your scenario, in the but in the conclusions, you said it is possible to explain mu g minus two two, right? Can you can you comment on that? Oh, sorry, I, di I didn't catch the last part of your question. So because in the in the last slide, you mm -hmm. said you can explain mu g minus two and dark matter at the same time. Yes. So, but uh, you said the neutrino trident bound could exclude could exclude most of the parameter space. Yeah, so, so okay, so maybe uh, my talk was not well organized. So uh, I'm talking about in 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 the talk today. In mm -hmm. today, I am considering this region. Mm -hmm. ah, I see. So like so MG prime, MG prime is uh, it uh, very light, out. and uh, so for the benchmark point, I choose two two values. So one one around uh, ten mm -hmm. mb. Another one around 100 MeV. Mm -hmm. And the 10 MeV region is interesting because uh, it's, uh, it can also relax the Hubble tension through the mm -hmm. uh, extra neutrinos uh, mm -hmm. delta N effective. And I think this paper is, uh, this part was, I mean, this issue is nicely mm -hmm. described in the other papers, including mm -hmm. the previous speaker. Mm -hmm. And then, so we chose two uh, different benchmark points. Okay, mm -hmm. so we are always we always assume a G prime is order of ten to the minus four, G prime mass is around uh, ten to hundred MeV, mm -hmm. and if you do not include the dark Higgs, you can have a summer, correct summer latency only through the uh, dark pair annihilation to uh, only through this channel, mm -hmm. right? And so. I mean, you have to satisfy this condition to have a correct summer density mm -hmm. and mu g minus two. But if you include dark Higgs, which which give the G prime mass, mm. then the, the this condition can be uh, 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 relaxed, completely mm. relaxed. I and I will show the number of different results. Mm. Okay, thank you. Thank yeah, you. Well, yeah, interesting result. Okay. Uh, are there more questions? May I have a question? Yes. Yeah. yes. So what's the uh, preferred mass range for the new Higgs particle? So I, I wonder well, if uh, this new, new particle it, can it, be... It really depend, depends on the uh, parameter space. Uh, let, me, let me show you. I mean, it, it's, I don't think we can really pin down uh, So for the generic case, generic case, this is the uh, parameter speed, like quartic coupling, the dark Higgs and the dark matter, complex scalar dark matter quartic coupling. And this is a, a dark Higgs mass. Mm -hmm. And the solid line here is uh, all uh, can give the correct relic density without violation of the direct detection bound, okay? So we can have, for example, 100, uh, 1000 TB dark matter in the, along this region. Mm -hmm. And the dark Higgs mass is around uh, from two two GeV to hundred GeV, basically all free. All right. So in in the case of light gauge bosons, a prime, the L two can have um, nice sensitivity. 
I wonder if L2 can help to probe um, this uh, new. Yeah, it depends. Uh, it will depend on the uh, darkest mass scale, depending mm -hmm. on the. I, I had some prelim preliminary study of this kind of case, but they did not write the paper. But uh, anyway, it, it really depends on the darkest mass scale. Okay. Yeah. yeah thank you. So dark X will eventually decay into a uh, pair of dark X boson. And uh, now in this case, G prime is very small. So dark matter may, may can, lifetime can be uh, uh, somewhat long, I mean, not prompt to decay, et cetera. Uh, yeah. So yeah, th I, 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 th the main point today of my talk will be that the, including the dark X field, the, the dark X boson, the, the phenomenon of dark matter and the preferred region of parameter space, they can all change it uh, substantially, significantly. Actually, I, when I see this plot, I, I have a concern on the heavy dark Higgs masses because mm -hmm. uh, G prime is so light mm -hmm. so that the it might be in a strongly coupled region with a heavy dark Higgs mm -hmm. because it's much heavier than G prime, right? Yeah, but the dark, dark marrow mass itself is given by hand in this. I mean, dark Higgs, I'm, I'm talking about dark Higgs. Mm -hmm. I think we impose the, we impose the perturbative bound, but the Mm. Uh, I mean, I mean the, I think the, some some part of the constraint we have to uh, um, recheck. Mm. I mean the uh, dark Higgs step coupling determines dark Higgs mass, so mm -hmm. probably uh, you need to yeah. choose large uh, dark Higgs coupling to get heavy. Yeah, right. But the V phi is also uh, independent, so we have to. Uh, so we are we are trying we are trying to uh, construct give we are we are imposing a standard constraint, mm. including the perturbativity of the uh, mm. parameters. Mm, I see. Yeah. So we are, as I mentioned, that this result are uh, preliminary, and we are going to recheck. We are rechecking mm. the all, all the uh, numbers again. So mm. final, mm. the plus in the that will include that will be included in the paper may be changed from this slide, but. The, Main message should be mm, the same. Mm, mm. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you for uh, Pyongyang Ko for his nice uh, presentation. And then the, the morning, the first session in the morning, uh, and, uh, this is the end of the first session in the morning. And we will resume the morning session at 11.20. Uh, so we have about 23 minutes a coffee break. Feel free please to drink your coffee and come back at 11.20. Thank you. Can we still stay? Okay, the next speaker of the morning session is Jongchol Park from Chungnam National University. He will uh, talk about, uh, I'm, you are, Oh, just I don't see minute. the title, sorry. <laughs> yeah, just, just one minute, yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. I wanna, uh, change the size of my mouse point. Yeah, just for me. Okay, so the title of his talk is Cosmic Induced uh, Boosted Dark Matter. Please. Okay. So your talk presentation is for 25 minutes and five minutes for discussion. Okay. okay. So yeah, thank you for introduction. Okay. Yeah, yeah. First of all, uh, thank Professor Hyunmin and yeah other organizers for this nice workshop and inviting me. Yeah, today, yeah, I would like to introduce a, a new document boosting mechanism in present universe, uh, and uh, they are such a using large volume uh, document and neutron detectors. Uh, yeah, this talk will be mainly based on. Uh, these papers done in collaboration with uh, Yong Su, uh, Sang Chan uh, in the university, and Huan Cheng in uh, Tsinghua University in Taiwan. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I noticed any details on dark matter. Yeah, because yeah, we already know the 
ีสโตตัสก็แม้แต่จะเป็นสอบทีบไปลาสโชอุปจบเอชันส์ตัดเชตเจอลาสโชเทชันก็คุมาคลัสเตอร์เซมิแอนด์สโตนแอนด์สโตนในสถานการณ์ในโมเดลฟิสิกส์อันดับสตันดิ้งตัวนิชโอฟดักเมนต์ก็เป็นหนึ่งในปัญหาที่มีต่อไปในโลกนี้ผู้ต้องการสังเกตุผลของการใช้ดักเมนต์เราใช้วิธีการใช้ดักเมนต์ที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็นธรรมดาในการสร้างโครงการที่มีความเป็คุณสังเกตุภาพชั้นหรือดีเทคชั้นหรือคลายต่อผลิตภัณฑ์ชั้นส่วนคุณสังเกตุภาพว่าผลิตภัณฑ์ชั้นนี้จะถูกเพิ่มขึ้นจากการทดสอบในสถานการณ์นี้เราไม่สามารถบอกได้ว่าวันนี้เป็นเวลาที่ดีที่จะเปลี่ยนแปลงมุมมองของเราในทิศทางของสังคมวันนี้ผมรีบๆให้คุณได้รับการแนะนำ Uh, various aspects of so-called booster dark matter. Okay, uh, by combining yeah, two approaches, yeah, so-called dark matter detection and uh, dark matter indirect detection approach, uh, we can make a new idea. Uh, the key feature of the idea is uh, inelastic or elastic uh, scatter or uh, wimp or other uh, scale uh, relativistic uh, dark matter particle Collide with nuclei or electron. So, yeah, such a elliptic particle can be produced uh, so called the second process, and then uh, collision is uh, very similar to the first approach in the sense uh, this process uh, approach or process is uh, the combination of first and second approach. Okay, uh, there already exist uh, various uh, scenario and model producing energy dark matter. In the current universe, the first category uh, requires uh, extended uh, dark sector. Uh, such a uh, scenario uh, producing boosted dark matter can be visualized like this uh, diagram. Uh, the first one is a heavier dark matter particle annular into a lighter one, or uh, some pale dark matter annular into a single dark matter plus some uh, other lighter particle, or last. Uh, Option is a uh, heavier dark matter particle decay into uh, lighter dark matter particle like this way. Uh, in these scenarios, uh, Rayleigh component uh, dark matter is of course non-relative. However, uh, only a tiny fraction of uh, dark matter produced from uh, those uh, dark sector annihilation or decay in the universe today is relative. So, uh, in order to detect is boost the component dark matter signal, we need a large volume uh, dark matter or neutrino detector. Uh, there is yeah, one interesting uh, short comment on the distinct uh, uh, concentral dynamics in uh, those kind of uh, multi uh, component, <coughs> sorry, uh, uh, multi component dark matter scenario. Uh, very recently, we uh, found that uh, the summer evolution of subcompound dark matter is significantly affected by uh, size of self scattering uh, that is naturally uh, realized uh, 
or sub JB scale like uh, documenter. Uh, more details on uh, this work uh, will be discussed by uh, Saodong talk on Thursday. So uh, 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 please uh, see uh, Saodong talk uh, if you are interested in some uh, cosmical dynamics or uh, this kind of multi component document scenario. Okay, uh, let's look into a little bit more on uh, this annihilating two component document model. Okay, uh, in the current universe, uh, this uh, lighter kion particle can be produced from uh, the pair annihilation of heavier document particle chi zero. And then such chi one can travel uh, relativistically due to the uh, mass difference between chi zero and chi one. Finally, this relativistic uh, chi one can scatter or target particle uh, in an experiment and result in energetic recoil signature inside the detail like this way. Uh, this process is quite uh, similar to uh, production of energetic neutrino and uh, photons from dark matter annihilation. So the calculation process is also very similar to uh, this well-known uh, annihilation process. Okay, the uh, signal signature can be simply energetic, uh, elastic, uh, liquid, or electron proton, or uh, uh, we can think about uh, additional uh, signal from the decay of heavier unstable dark state, uh, state or excited state type two. Uh, but for this additional feature, we need some uh, expenses or minimalize or underlying uh, uh, BDM model. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, by focusing on uh, this part, yeah, the blue circle uh, <coughs> Part uh, we can find an interesting document detection approach, uh, which will be discussed a little bit uh, later. Okay, yeah, actually, uh, boost document is no more just a theoristic idea currently, uh, because uh, and nowadays, a uh, boost document model uh, the receiving more rising uh, attention as an alternative to the conventional input scenario. Yeah, several years ago. Mm, so the uh, first official search result for elastic uh, boost dark matter and inelastic boost dark matter has been reported by uh, super cambio kind collaboration and cost 100 collaboration experiment. Uh, moreover, uh, boost dark matter is now officially included as a, um, uh, one of boost uh, BSM uh, search targets in uh, Dune experiment. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, okay. Oh, so yeah, I'll uh, shortly, uh, uh, I very briefly comment, a little bit more comment on uh, this uh, second article. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, in this paper, yeah, 2008, this paper, uh, we, uh, for the first time, point out the uh, document detection experiment, including general one turn, uh, could be sensitive enough to energetic uh, electrode recoil uh, induced by boost dark matter uh, by pumping up a uh, boost dark matter flux with a similar uh, chi zero mass uh, because the flux is uh, inversely proportional to the mass of M0, yeah, yeah, as you can see from this simple relation. Uh, due to low energy stressor loop uh, dark matter detector, such as cos 100 or gen 1 ton, LG, or, and so on, uh, one can uh, measure uh, relatively low recoil energy signals of boost dark matter, uh, even with uh, tone scale uh, dark matter detector. Yeah. Uh, such a thing is uh, discussed in our paper. And then, uh, inspired by uh, our theoretical uh, study done in this paper, the first uh, official uh, search result for uh, boost dark matter has been reported by Kusan uh, 100 collaboration. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, uh, a little bit more details on uh, this uh, uh, search will be uh, discussed by uh, Chang Yun's talk uh, in the next. Okay. Uh, interestingly, uh, 
uh, document detector only with 100 kilogram scale uh, target mass. The cosine 100 has uh, around 100 kilogram scale yeah, target mass. Uh, such a detector even can cover an explored parameter region, yeah, even though uh, the region is very tiny and this result also has some uh, model parameter dependence. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, as you know, uh, 2020 summer, uh, Genome One Tone uh, collaboration reported uh, an excess of electron recoil event over known uh, background around uh, 2 to 4 kV region. For this uh, excess, uh, the interpretation with a uh, conventional non relative documenter is less stable, even for uh, this kind of uh, very heavy uh, documenter mass. However, uh, uh, such a problem uh, is avoidable uh, with non-conventional dark sector scenario. For example, uh, actual light particle or dark photon, uh, inelastic nature of uh, dark matter, or uh, very uh, energetic dark matter. Uh, today, uh, I will focus on yeah, this part. Okay, so as I uh, already explained, uh, dark matter theoretic design experiment, uh, to, including Gen 1 ton, would be uh, sensitive enough to energetic uh, electron uh, uh, recoil induced by boost dark matter by pumping up uh, the boost dark matter flux and, uh, and uh, the fasting, fast moving uh, dark matter uh, is required for uh, KBSK electron recoil event uh, in Gen 1 ton. So combining uh, the two uh, factors, uh, various uh, dark matter, various boost dark matter scenarios have been studied for uh, Geno Moto anomaly. Uh, so, actually, I'll not discuss any uh, details on uh, those models, but uh, the main point is uh, the boost dark matter can be a good solution for Geno Moto anomaly yeah, yeah, due to these two interesting uh, observations. However, uh, for uh, this interpretation, we need to consider a couple of important factors first. How about uh, contributions from inner shell electron? Uh, another one is uh, how about uh, dependence on the type of dark matter and mediator? Uh, uh, such factors uh, have been well studied in uh, these works. And so please uh, these uh, papers for more details because, yeah. Uh, discussing on this factor is not main part of uh, this talk. Okay, now uh, let's move on to uh, another category of dark matter boost mechanism, that is the cosine ray uh, induced boost dark matter mechanism, uh, you can see from uh, this uh, cartoon. Mm -hmm. Cosine ray can uh, boost up uh, dark matter. Okay, uh, this uh, energetic uh, cosine ray uh, from uh, sun or supernova explosion, black hole evaporation, pulsar, and so on. Yeah, we can get uh, lots of, uh, of energetic cosmic rays from uh, those kind of astrophysical objects. Uh, then uh, uh, we can think about uh, the energetic cosmic ray induced uh, boost dark mechanism uh, through some uh, interaction between this uh, energy cosmic ray and dark matter. So, Process is quite simple. Uh, the energetic uh, cosine particle uh, kick uh, dark matter particle like uh, this way, mm. and then the recoil uh, dark matter particle gets large kinetic energy through uh, the collision. Uh, yeah, this process is usually uh, efficient for yeah, light dark matter. Yeah, because the incoming cosine ray particle mass is. Uh, at most just GB or yeah, around MeV or even less. So the energy transfer process is uh, more efficient for light dark matter. Okay, for the efficient energy transfer uh, from cosine ray to uh, dark matter through the collision, uh, some interaction between uh, dark matter and stem model particles are required. Uh, for example, we can think about coupling only to proton or electron or both proton and electron. Uh, 
or another option is uh, uh, both coupling to electron uh, cha um, charged uh, and neutral lepton, so sort of some leptophilic uh, coupling. Actually, the calculation of the boost uh, dark matter energy spectra for uh, these uh, processes are quite similar uh, each other, even with uh, different types of coson rays. However, the last one, the neutrino induced case, is a little bit more complicated. I uh, discuss a little bit more about uh, the last option uh, very shortly. Okay. Uh, yeah. The first option is uh, the charged cosmic ray induced boost dark matter. Yeah, this one is uh, a little bit more simple and uh, we can easily understand. So, uh, energetic uh, cosmic ray. Uh, uh, easy to accelerate a fraction of dark matter particle to relatively speed. The cosmic ray uh, flux it. Uh, so in uh, yeah this part, the last part, the uh, cosmic ray uh, flux is uh, obtained by solving uh, some uh, diffusion uh, equation with a widely uh, used galactic cosmic ray propagation model, mm -hmm. uh, something like using uh, or something like that, and then. Uh, for simplicity, many people uh, typically assume that uh, this part of cosmic ray flux is homogeneous inside the region of integration uh, uh, shape, uh, modeling some cylindrical shape uh, centered on the center. Then, uh, by uh, converting uh, dark matter cosmic ray particle I, uh, different scattering cross section with uh, this. Uh, charged cosmic ray flux, uh, one can uh, relatively easily obtain the final uh, dark matter flux through uh, this equation. Okay, uh, as an application, we try to fit the observed electron recoil excess at Zeno one ton by introducing new electrophilic interaction. Mm -hmm. And then we can find a group P2, the, uh, the data from Zeno one ton. Uh, Experiment uh, even satisfy uh, existing constraint on the model at the same time. Mm -hmm. The constraint looks like the shell region, and then the flip, the, the best fit point is the uh, this black uh, start point. So in this situation, we can have uh, one more question: How about uh, the Effects from cosmic ray neutrino for electrophilic interaction. Because if we introduce some electrophilic interaction, uh, then dark matter can also have coupling to the uh, energy neutrino. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is uh, the uh, last mechanism. Uh, for the dark matter with electrophilic interaction, uh, energy cosmic ray neutrino also can kick non electrophilic hello dark matter particle. And then, uh, consequently, the recoil uh, dark matter particle get large kinetic energy through you know, this kind of collision. Mm -hmm. So, as you know, uh, enormous uh, number of stars in the galaxy can be good source of energy tank neutrino because uh, their uh, fusion mechanism uh, can produce lots of energy tank uh, neutrino. Okay, uh, through, okay, yeah. Uh, the through uh, this uh, equation, we can calculate the uh, boost dark matter flux from neutrino drop from a single uh, sun-like uh, star. Here, uh, the x uh, and y and j uh, respectively reflect the position of uh, uh, yeah, Earth and star and dark matter. Uh, uh, centered on the uh, center. And then, uh, uh, yeah, uh, here, uh, yeah, so this part, the, uh, the and that over the K, yeah, this part is the neutrino uh, emission rate for sun like star. And here, at uh, tilde one, uh, reflect. Uh, the variation of stellar uh, properties from the sun. And then the second line, yeah, the second line looks simple, but uh, uh, in reality, yeah, the 
the second line is quite complicated equation. But anyway, the second line takes into account the uh, fraction that the scatter in angle of dark matter uh, uh, set up bar uh, coincide with uh, the uh, direction to the earth uh, set up bar zero, uh, which is determined by some uh, kinematic relation uh, through this k nu and uh, k uh, dm. And then uh, the attenuation of neutrino flux due to uh, propagation is determined by uh, this exponential function in the last time, uh, where uh, this uh, d nu is the mean free path of neutrino. Okay, uh, even uh, though the uh, sun uh, probed by uh, uh, the largest neutrino flux to uh, the Earth, uh, the only small uh, volume of nearby uh, dark matter halo uh, comprise the boost dark flux. Therefore, uh, in order to get uh, the final neutrino uh, boosted dark matter flux uh, in our galaxy, we need to consider entire uh, stellar contribution in the Milky Way by convoluting uh, uh, this equation with uh, some stellar distribution inside our uh, galaxy. Uh -huh. The process uh, can be done through uh, this uh, equation. Yeah, here, the uh, uh, circle flux uh, from a single star yeah, plug into uh, the uh, last equation and then convert it with uh, the star distribution inside our galaxy. Yeah, we can uh, get uh, entire stellar contribution in the galaxy for neutrino boost dark matter. Okay, uh, for compare region, we present uh, boost dark matter uh, fluxes by uh, cosmic uh, electron, uh, solar neutrino, and total uh, star neutrino uh, inside the galaxy uh, as a uh, red, green, and blue lines, respectively, uh, as you can see from uh, this uh, left hand panel. Of, uh, okay, uh, actually, to get uh, this kind of uh, line, uh, we use uh, this uh, benchmark parameter set for a electrophilic dark matter model having uh, democratic coupling to uh, the both uh, electron and neutrino. Uh, and then uh, the right hand panel shows us the dependence of uh, boost dark matter flux uh, on the message of dark matter and mediator. Uh, the key feature uh, we can get from uh, those kind of uh, figures is uh, that uh, we can find that uh, solar and star neutrino uh, can be very efficiently boost up light dark matter uh, up to around 10 MeV, uh, like this way. Yeah, as you can see from uh, this uh, uh, purple line. Mm -hmm, purple line. So uh, even uh, a, uh, 5 MeV dark matter can be boosted up like this way. Yeah. So here, uh, the solar line connects to uh, neutrino boosted uh, component, and uh, that uh, line connects to uh, cosmic electron uh, boosted dark matter. As you can see from uh, this uh, figure, the uh, yeah, even neutrino boosted dark matter uh, can be uh, the flux uh, larger than uh, cosmic electron uh, boosted dark matter flux. <laughs> so uh, we can conclude that oh. Uh, we can find the solar star neutrino can be very efficient boost the uh, light dark matter. At the same time, uh, this process uh, can be more efficient than cosmic uh, electron uh, booster for uh, up to uh, around 100 to uh, 1,000 uh, kilo EV uh, kinetic energy. You have uh, five minutes for discussion. Oh, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, this uh, figure show uh, us the set uh, dependence of the neutrino boost dark flux. Uh -huh. uh, here, set means uh, the angle uh, from the center to uh, the uh, incoming uh, dark matter, boost dark matter flux. So, as you can see from uh, this figure, uh -huh. so, uh, uh, for example, uh, one uh, KB uh, kinetic energy boosted uh, dark matter. Uh, mostly concentrated around the central region. Mm -hmm. 
and then however uh yeah relatively uh, higher boosted dark matter uh, can contribute uh, a little bit uh, wider region and also the concentration uh, or uh, uh, income direction has some dependence on dark matter mass so in the sense uh, the uh, self part dependence uh, income direction uh, dependence of neutrino butacum flux can be used to determine uh, the mass of dark matter in the uh, near future so this is the last star of my talk so uh, as a final application uh, we uh, uh, based on our neutrino boost uh, dark matter mechanism we can uh, try to find some uh, p to the gen one tone data the uh, green circle uh, region is uh, the preferred uh, one sigma level preferred uh, region to the gen one tone you know, electron uh, liquid access and then uh, the uh, gray shaded region is uh, x by gen one tone data uh, if we assuming a democratic coupling to neutrino and electron Okay, and then uh, the upper region of the shaded region, uh, uh, yeah, as you can see, there is uh, some upper, uh, 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 even upper limit on uh, this uh, exclusion region. Uh, this upper uh, uh, limit is uh, coming from uh, the boost document flux attenuation by the, the earth crust due to the underground location of detector. So uh, through some collision between earth crust and boost dark matter, uh, their flux uh, should be alternative. So, uh, yeah. so with very high scattering cross section, uh, we cannot get any boost dark flux uh, for underground uh, dark matter detector or neutron detector. Okay, this is a summary of my talk. Uh, so yeah, I will just uh, point out something. Uh, various uh, mechanism for boost dark matter is on the market. Uh, based on uh, dark sector annihilation decay or uh, energy cosmic induced uh, mechanism. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you're adopting this energy cosmic uh, uh, induced boost dark mechanism, uh, uh, light dark matter is quite efficient for the uh, boosting process. And then one more interesting point is uh, neutrino boost dark matter flux can be larger than cosmic electron uh, boost dark matter flux for uh, the boost the uh, dark matter kinetic energy less than 100 to uh, 1000 kilo electron volt. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your nice talk. Are there uh, questions, comments? Uh, may I ask uh, one question? Yeah, Kimiko. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, for cosmically induced or boosted dark matter, yeah. I'm wondering the differences between the boson dark matter and the fermion dark matter. Uh, uh, even, uh, uh, your question is the difference between bosonic and fermion dark matter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Even, ah, though uh -huh. the, yeah even though the relic density is the same between these, microscopically, for example, boson can be made the condensate. And also, mm -hmm. fermion can be applied the fer power exclusion principle. So, yeah. is there, is, is it can change the result? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, very nice uh, question. Uh, actually, uh, uh, to get uh, this kind of comparison for uh, cosmic electron and neutrino boost dark matter, yeah, we just assume fermion dark matter mm -hmm. for simplicity. Uh, mm -hmm. However, yeah, of course, uh, there's some. Uh, uh, Difference between uh, scattering, uh, differential scattering cross section formula for fermionic and uh, uh, bosonic uh, dark matter. Even also, there's some dependence on the uh, spin of mediator. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. That part is the scattering uh, cross section formula. But mm -hmm. your question is the condensation. Yeah, because mm -hmm. bosonic yeah, particle yeah. Uh, much more easily condensate the center. However, mm -hmm. uh, the, we are considering a little bit. Yeah, such a condition, condition is more and more efficient for uh, very ultra light uh, dark matter particle. Mm. Uh, for example, yeah, less than electron volt uh, mass. But uh, as you can see from yeah, this figure, uh, we are uh, considering uh, some like KB to MeV range dark matter. So 
uh, for this mass scale, the condensation effect of Bose bar tachometer is not uh, significant compared to fermion. So uh, mm. I, my guess is much more uh, difference for Bose and fermion tachometer is mm -hmm. uh, mostly uh, come from uh, this part uh, here. Uh, okay. yeah. Here, yeah, this part. The different scattered cross section has some mm -hmm. uh, uh, significant dependence on uh, spin type of documenter and mediator. Oh. Thank you very much for clear explanation. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, I have a short question about the angular dependence of your uh, neutrino boosted uh, dark matter. Can you show us the yeah. angular distribution? So, yeah. uh, so it, it depends on the uh, uh, dark matter kinetic energy after collision uh, with the neutrino, oh, yeah. right? Cosmic mm -hmm. neutrinos. So, uh, can you distinguish uh, between? I mean, this, between these two cases in some experiment, do you have a uh, uh, yeah, yeah. particular experiment in mind or? Yeah, actually, yeah, that's a very good question. Yeah, this is actually uh, a kind of circle level calculation because in reality, we need to uh, say recall energy. Uh, yeah, because this is the kinetic energy of incoming boost dark matter, but we just measure recall electron or proton energy, not yeah, this incoming boost dark matter kinetic energy. So, yeah, so as a next step, we are calculating uh, the recall energy, not yeah, incoming kinetic energy yeah, boost dark matter. But anyway, yeah, we provide this kind of figure uh, because uh, this kind of figure can provide us a kind of intuition. Yeah, so your question is our yeah, next uh, calculation step. I see. So the recall, recall energy spectrum will follow- It's much more efficient. Yeah, important. Follow yeah. this distribution maybe, right? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> probably. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I think the less than uh, Jongchal for his nice talk again. Uh, let's move on to the next speaker. Uh, Changyun, are you ready? Okay, so next speaker is the Changyun Ha from Zhuang University, our university. Uh, he will talk about a uh, recent uh, result of cosine 100, please. Hi, uh, this is Changhyun, can you hear me okay? <clears throat> yes. Okay, uh, I'll talk about the recent result of uh, cosine 100 experiment on behalf of the cosine 100 collaboration. Uh, First of all, thanks uh, for inviting me in this uh, exciting uh, workshop. Uh, I'll do my best in updating uh, cosine 100 results. Uh, I'd like to i like to thank uh, actually one more person in this time who's uh, who's uh, the previous speaker, uh, Professor Jong Chol Park. Uh, in few occasions in uh, recent conferences, it was always uh, uh, cases where Zhongchul uh, presented first in theoretical part and I presented uh, somewhat experimental part. So it was uh, always uh, my goal to predict uh, what Zhongchul would uh, present beforehand. So this time, uh, I think I got it a little bit more <laughs> than the last time, okay. Uh, it was uh, actually, uh, we go back a very long time, uh, about eight years ago at the time, we actually talked about the cosmic ray induced uh, dark matter or neutrinos in very different uh, scale, but uh, hopefully uh, we continue to this kind of uh, collaboration. Well, anyway, uh, I'll skip the dark matter motivations. Uh, in the uh, direct detection, uh, there are two kinds of methods, uh, as you all uh, know. One is on the left, uh, typically uh, you define your nuclear recoil 
uh, done by dark matter collision uh, using uh, typical uh, proton recoil or neutron recoil uh, source. In this particular case, AMBE uh, radioactive source, you define the signal region, in this case, this. And then uh, you measure your background for a long time from your experiment. And in the end, uh, you open the box uh, to see if there is uh, event in the defined signal region. There are significant number of events. Uh, you detect dark matter, otherwise you set a limit. So I would call this analysis as a rate analysis. The most important thing in this case is to understand your detector, how large is your background. The second method, on the other hand, uh, you uh, look for uh, time dependent variation of your background. Uh, in this particular case, uh, it's called annual modulation. Basically, uh, our solar system uh, moves around the galactic center and sun, Earth or our detector is moving around the sun. So that kind of motion creates the uh, the dark matter interaction momentum transfer. So in the target, sometimes you measure higher number of uh, higher energy events. Other times you measure uh, higher number of low energy momentum transfer that will create some residual spectrum in your data rate. There is one experiment called uh, DAMA or uh, more recent data, it says Dama Libra. Dama Libra has shown uh, the modulation uh, signal, which is basically a background, spec background subtracted signal as function of time. Currently it's more than uh, 20 years of data. In previous uh, data I show in this plot only uh, 13 years. It's so almost a ton, ton year uh, scale, several ton year scale at, at this time. The modulation is clearly seen in the data uh, when you fit with the uh, standard halo model where you have peak in June 2nd uh, with the period one year and amplitude almost at, almost at 1%. So the amplitude 0.01 uh, count per day per kilogram per KEB time is uh, the maximum time is June 2nd with one year period. This uh, excess of amplitude happens only from DAMA data's low energy region, mainly one to six KEB region. In the previous uh, data, they show from two to six KEB region, their background rate is about one count per day per kilogram KEB or one DRU. So you, make uh, this background data as function of uh, time, the rate sometimes goes up, the residual rate sometimes goes up and other times go down, so on. And that happens uh, mostly from the events between uh, two to six KeV, their phase one and one to six KeV from their phase two. So when they uh, presented phase two, data a few years back, uh, they still showed the modulation uh, spectrum. From this uh, DAMA uh, detector, DAMA detector is made out of uh, crystal scintillator. Basically the crystal scintillator technology, uh, the main goal of this technology is to collect as much visible light as possible, as much photon as possible. You typically attach 
the crystal with the PMT and that makes a detector. And what happens is that you absorb uh, high energy, uh, relatively high energy uh, event and convert the crystal converts slightly lower energy photon. Crystal uh, has very good resolution. Typically it produces a lot of uh, photons since it has, uh, it is composed of uh, large nuclei and uh, high density, it has very good uh, stopping power. So typically all the gammas are stopped within a very small crystal. But the uh, technical difficulty is uh, the crystal can melt in normal environment. So you have to encapsulate very well. And the crystal is expensive, very difficult to make a pure crystal. So it's uh, in terms of uh, timing, uh, it's slow uh, to scale up in large mass. In Korea, uh, Korea invisible mass, met, mass, mass search, sorry, not meta search, mass search. The Kim's experiment started this endeavor uh, earlier in two, around 2000. And uh, it started with the 12 uh, cesium iodide crystals, each with 8.7 kilogram. And at that time, it achieved uh, three DLU, three count per key per day per kilogram per KEB with the threshold of uh, three uh, KEB. Of course, uh, the main goal at the, at the time, the main goal was to detect uh, WIMP uh, nucleus interaction. And, but uh, it had uh, same element as DAMA, which is iodine. So also studied the DAMA modulation signal with the iodine and uh, basically excluded at the time the iodine uh, signal region with the same nuclei. For the NAI effort, efforts is basically upgrade of that. So in this case, since uh, sodium iodide has sodium, which is uh, lower mass nuclei, and mainly this comparison is basically uh, sodium to sodium. So in Korea, we have cosine experiment, Japan, P colon, and Sabure experiment in Europe. Uh, the main uh, driver is NIS uh, experiment. So its competition is also there. The cosine experiment is basically joint collaboration between Kim's and uh, South Pole dark matter experiment, DMIs, to search for dark matter interactions in sodium iodide, five countries and 15 institutes. And <laughs> 50 scientists at the moment are working. Kim's experiments and cosine experiment are located uh, the same place, uh, basically 50 meters apart in Yangyang Underground Laboratory, uh, uh, about uh, 700 meters from the surface. Nowadays, we typically do most of the R&D in Kim's experiment. So it's this Kim's experiment still working really uh, hard and cosine experiment is just continuously taking data. Cosine experiment is a typical uh, low background dark matter experiment. We have crystal in the middle and that is that are submerged in the liquid scintillator about uh, 2200 liters and those are seen by uh, other PMTs and shielded by copper and 20 centimeters of lead. Since the depth is not too deep, we have additional muon panels to tag the uh, remaining muons. The view is uh, like this before we started uh, experiment in 2016. 
we monitor or well, everyone in the collaboration uh, take shifts and we monitor data uh, by uh, smartphones and we monitor more than 100 parameters uh, for the detector and another 100 parameters for the uh, data. We've been taking data uh, quite smoothly uh, other than uh, the calibration period, we have accumulated more than five years of data uh, continuously with the uh, good run lifetime of uh, larger than 90%. The main, uh, the unique feature uh, compared to other uh, sodium iodide dark matter experiment is uh, the crystal uh, liquid scintillator coincidence. As I said, uh, in cosine, there is two tons of liquid that are <laughs> encompassing the crystals. So when you have something like potassium, 40 decay, you have 3 keV small signal deposited within the crystal and outgoing uh, 1460 keV gamma is detected by the liquid. So we do this kind of coincidence measurement to reduce uh, background in the ROI region. The efficiency is 70 to 80%. Later, I'll talk a little bit, but uh, we use uh, this technique, this coincidence technique to do uh, other dark matter searches like uh, boosted uh, dark matter. Basically, uh, once we take the data, we reduce the uh, muon events and environmental background external gammas by using analysis cuts and veto algorithms and arrive this black dotted line as environmental background signal. With that, we use uh, the dark matter model, in this case, uh, this exponential component as signal. We search uh, whether this kind of signal exists our data or not. This is constant rate analysis. At the same time, uh, we accumulate large amount of data, we can do the time dependent background modulation analysis as well. So in the meantime, uh, we accumulate large amount of data, we searched a small amount of data with the 2k EB threshold, uh, the constant rate analysis, and by by doing that, uh, we understand our detector very well. As you can see, the red line is our simulation, black dots our, are our real data. By using, uh, we can uh, set or uh, we can limit the uh, standard halo model in this case. And the first analysis with the 2K EB threshold, uh, we presented uh, annual modulation analysis with the 1.7 years of data and we presented uh, consistent result with zero modulation or maybe you can interpret this as uh, also consistent with the uh, DAMA. Again, as you can see from the uh, uncertainty of the amplitude, uh, we still needed to collect more data. In the meantime, we lowered uh, our threshold further by using uh, various uh, deep learning and machine learning techniques. And with the 1.7 years of data, uh, we have a factor of 10 improvement in terms of constant rate analysis. So basically we accumulate, we increase the data more than uh, several tens of times. At the same time, we lowered our threshold. So compare with the previous uh, rate analysis, we reduced our uh, limit further down. At the same time, there were uh, some questions from, especially from theoretical communities that uh, if you use our own quenching 
or if you uh, if uh, if the models are slightly different, uh, for example, ISO spin violating cases or effective field theory operators one by one, uh, what would happen? So we answer those questions as well. In general, we find that those are all incompatible with the current cosine 100 data. We do not find any excess of events over the expected background, or in other words, we can explain uh, the low energy spectrum with, uh, with the current understanding of our data. That means it can be interpreted as Dharma's annual modulation signal under the standard halo model assumption uh, may not work. So this is an article a few months back. Is the end in sight for the famous dark matter claim? The answer is not yet, because uh, if this is uh, not from the uh, halo model, then what is this? So we still need to investigate annual modulation. So in the meantime, we have accumulated three years of data at the same time, lower threshold with 1KEB, we searched annual modulation, the rate, residual rate as function of uh, time. Or in this case, uh, we plot uh, the total rate about three DLU as function of time, as function of different crystal. In this analysis, uh, we found uh, one to six KEB region 0 0.0067 plus minus 0 0.0042 DRU. Still compared to Dharma, we have four times larger uh, uncertainty. So the current results are still statistics limited. Uh, we need better detector. To, to give you a sense, uh, I, I, I made an analogy. Uh, let's say we weigh a WIMP for the Dharma Libra case with the 20 years of data, they measured this amount, 1.05 plus minus 0 0.11 times 10 to the negative two DRU. So I can plot uh, as the mass of the WIMP in this arrow. For the NIs, our competitor and cosine, as you can see, the tick marks are sparse. A nice case, a nice case negative 0 0.34 plus minus 0 0.42. Cosine case, 0 0.67 plus minus 0 0.42. In terms of our uncertainties, we are almost uh, compatible but the mean values are pointing in different directions. So NIE's case, uh, they claim about two and a half sigmas away from Dharma signal. In cosine case, we are saying we are consistent with zero, consistent with Dharma signal as well. Statistically, you can simply uh, do the back of the envelope calculations. Uh, for example, let's say we add NIE's data with cosine 100 data at this moment. You can say we have the mean value, we can just average, uh, so it would be 0.16 or so. And the uncertainty goes, it's almost twice, so it will decrease by 40% square root of two. So this becomes 0 0.26, 27 or so. So the combined result would be uh, somewhere in 0 0.15 and the tick marks would increase about 40%. So you would have one more tick marks which means it would still be away from the Dharma signal 
at about 3.5 sigmas. So the conclusion with the current setup, it is still hard to reach five sigma test to the DAMA experiment. We, in the meantime, we do a very low energy nuclear recoil search, sub-GEB nuclear recoil with different te technique called MGDAL effect. And probably using this, uh, we can do the uh, cosmic ray induced neutrino search that Jongchul uh, presented as well. So what happened is that when a nuclear recoil happens by low energy sub-GEB wind, the recoil signal is very small, small by the nucleus. So in fact, we cannot detect directly, but uh, the MGDAL effect says after the recoil, the electrons are basically lagged. So it's lagging behind, which means it is uh, excited. So if you look for electron excitation signals, uh, you can search for sub-GEB uh, nuclear recoils due to the WIMS as well. So as you can see, black line is uh, just typical nuclear recoil signal, assuming one GEB. But if you consider MGDAL effect, the electron and photon signals, they go all the way to one and two uh, KEB region. So we can do the uh, search. So Cosine did this kind of search. At the moment, uh, it's not uh, very competitive, but once we upgrade to cosine 200, at least spin dependent uh, parameter space, uh, we will have uh, a, a good competition with other experiment. In elastic boosted dark matter search, Jong uh, uh, asked me to give uh, some more details. The experimentally, we we, we apply the muon uh, coincidence signal. So it's not muon first. And then uh, it has to have a signal in the crystal at the same time in the uh, liquid scintillator that also has been required with uh, sufficient energy. So energy greater than four MeV or away from uh, environmental background. And then we found about 20 uh, events. Uh, and from our uh, estimation, those could be from muons. So by fitting the number of uh, crystals that are hit in this high energy region, we can set uh, limit for some particular boosted dark matter uh, events. This was possible due to, uh, because we had uh, two tons of uh, active uh, liquid scintillator and coincidence uh, trigger logic in the detector. We do uh, other searches like uh, solar actions and uh, action signal like this one. And we conv convoluted with our detector resolution and efficiency becomes like this. And we search uh, the signal in our data. Of course, uh, at the moment, uh, our competitiveness is uh, not that great. But uh, recently we do uh, uh, some more search with the uh, annual modulations uh, with the uh, axion solar axion signals. So that result will come out. For the preparation for cosine 200, uh, we uh, made facility for uh, the raw material purifications and crystal uh, production and preliminary test shows the background rate uh, should be less than DAMA detector. So some of the photos with the created uh, crystals and G 
detectors made with these kind of setup. So at the R&D setup, we have already shown that our crystals are really pure. You and the question four. is... Sorry, you have a four minutes for this question. Okay, uh, I'll finish up. So the main question is that, can you make the large crystal? So last summer, we presented that we can make large crystal. So once we make large crystal, we can just cut smaller pieces, make detector and do the experiment. One uh, very nice development we had uh, past years is that we lower the temperature a little bit. Uh, for example, at negative 35 degrees Celsius, we can get more photons out of the crystal and not just photon and the nuclear recoil signals are separated further. Waveforms are producing uh, late heat and americium calibration shows it produces large amount of uh, beta gamma signal and thallium 208 internal background uh, shows uh, improved resolution. Alpha quenching is larger, which means alpha uh, events are separated much easily. So NAI crystal produces basically more light as temperature decreases. So cosine 200, uh, if you run 200 kilogram of detector three years, we can do uh, conclusive uh, DAMA test. For the experimental site, uh, Yemi Lab uh, is uh, currently actively under preparation. Uh, I heard uh, last week that all the uh, pavement has been finished. So not like this at the moment. So the pavement has been uh, finish, finished. So to summarize, uh, In cosine 100, uh, we have ruled out the theory, basically halo model that explains Dharma signal at the moment, uh, but we need to figure out what the modulation is. At the same time, we search for uh, low mass WIMPs uh, with Migdal effect and solar action, IBDM as well. Cosine 200 is under preparation, 2023, uh, uh, the moving will happen from Yangyang to Cheongsan. We will use homemade high purity, low background crystal. We currently plan to operate at negative 35 degrees Celsius. So all the shielding will be within the large uh, refrigerator. Yami Lab is uh, well underway. Yami Lab construction is well underway. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for your nice talk and nice overview on the cosine experiment. So, do you, are there any uh, questions and comments? So, okay. Uh, let me ask a question on uh, the sensitivity. Uh, the, you said the, at, at the current experiment, cosine 100 only, uh, you cannot reach five sigma uh, exclusion of Dhamma Libra. So uh, then uh, with, the current, uh, with the update, I mean, the, in uh, cosine 200, uh, can you reach five sigma uh, test? Yeah, uh, thanks for the uh, question. Yes, uh, basically, yes. Uh, in two cases, uh, sensitivity wise on the left plot, uh, if you do uh, cosine 200, uh, run three years, uh, this is the plot. So currently we have achieved one KEV threshold. So you look at the black dotted line. So this will, uh, this will conclusively uh, reject uh, Dharma signal region with the same target and same method. 
On the other hand, uh, if there is signal, then if you run uh, 200 kilogram for three years, uh, we can have seven sigma detection. So if there is modulation, uh, we can see this easily, uh, even without running uh, three years, maybe two years of data will tell us immediately at the five sigma level. This is possible because the Dharma signal is so large. Currently it's a 14 sigma. So with the small amount of data, uh, you can test. Okay, thank you. Uh, are there uh, more questions? Uh, in cosine experiment, uh, do you have also sensitivity to spin dependent uh, dark matter scattering? Oh, yeah, <laughs> we do. Sorry, uh, this time I didn't include. Mm. Uh, previous time uh, I included that, that slide. Okay, so, spin dependent case, uh, let me explain a little bit. Uh, in cosine experiment, we use sodium and iodine. Those nucleus both are spin uh, odd. So the spin dependent sensitivity is much better uh, than other experiments. For example, xenon. Xenon is spin even. So for the long term, uh, let's say cosine maybe a tone scale experiment uh, will be uh, very competitive uh, with other experiment, for example, uh, PICO experiment. But the PICO experiment uh, is just counting experiment. So we, we, we can measure in our case, uh, shapes and you know, counting together. So we have, uh, competitiveness in this endeavor, especially spin dependent coupling. Okay, uh, thank you. Yeah, hopefully we can increase uh, volume to one tone scale to, <laughs> to probe spin dependent dark matter scattering too. Because they, I think they, Dan Hooper also mentioned that the spin dependent uh, dark matter scattering might be important to test uh, this galactic center excess, I mean, dark matter interpretation of the uh, galactic center excess. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, the crystal factory is running. Mm -hmm. Once it's running, uh, you know, it's easy to produce a large number of crystals. One mm -hmm. point is very difficult. The typical time scale for uh, about 200 kilogram crystal is one week. So if the factory is running in full mode, uh, we can produce large amount of crystals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think that there are a lot of excitement uh, in this, uh, I mean, in the future also. <clears throat> okay. Uh, I think, think the uh, Chang Hyun for his nice overview on the cosine experiment perspective. And uh, this is the end of the morning session. So we will uh, resume uh, the workshop in the afternoon at 11, I thought at, uh, at 1, uh, 1 40, uh in the afternoon after lunch. So uh, please have a nice meal and come back at 1.40. Uh, so there will be more interesting uh, talks in the afternoon. Okay, thank you very much. See you later.